All right, so we are in the book of 1 Peter. We're looking at chapter 1. We'll look at verses 1 and 2, and then we'll go jump down to chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. And then we're going to kind of take a, a pause, a break, and I really only read these scriptures to kind of set the stage again of where we're heading. Uh, we are in a series called Strangers and Exiles. And that series is a series uh, talking about what, what does God's remnant people look like? What does God's, God's chosen people, the called out people, what do they look like? What do they do uh, in, in the midst of a time where they are the minority? Last week, we, we really established the fact that, that uh, who the called out ones were, right? And, and that they are God's chosen people. They are, they are a people that God has selected for his own possession, that they would be his people, and, and that they would be different than the world. And last week, I really talked about this contrast that has started to creep in, uh, or not started, but it's, it's, it's continuing and getting dr- uh, more, more drastic every day. You see this, this line where people and morality kind of blended pretty well together. People embraced the morality of the scriptures, even though they might not have thought it was a scripture. They, they looked a lot like what the scriptures had. What was wrong was wrong. Uh, and what was wrong in the scriptures, maybe was wrong to them. And what was right was right to them. But as culture continued to, to go, go forward, uh, they, they started taking a different turn, right? And they started pulling away from the morality of Scripture and, and what the Scriptures would tell us. And they, they chalked it up to basically whatever they wanted, but ultimately they wanted to follow their own desires and do what was right in their own mind. We see that in the book of Kings. Uh, they lived like there is no king, and they did whatever they wanted. And culture does that. Here, here's the problem. The church, because the culture and church were so, so close together, there were some, some ties that got kind of connected. And what's happened is as culture has moved and shifted, it has started to rip apart the fabric and foundation of, that, of the book. And, and some churches have said, well, well it, maybe the book's not quite what it should be, and, and we're going to move to the side as well. And, and they've gone to a different, different direction. Well, that's not what God's Word says. God's Word is inerrant. It is perfect. It is pure. It is always true, and it's useful for everything that we need. It has everything that we need there. So we really need to embrace God's word as God's word and say, this is what we're going to believe. If, if, if it's changing, if this isn't relevant anymore, then why are we even here? Why are we even here? It can't feel good to come under the conviction of the word of God preached or the word of God sung if it really doesn't matter. But we are here because we believe the word of God is true, and we're going to to cling to it and long for it and, and be changed by it. But understand, as the called out ones, we are to be different than the world around us. I mentioned last week, as the called out ones, it is as though more and more apparent that we do not fit in. Amen is right. I am so glad that we don't fit in. I don't want to fit in. I want, I want to love God. I want to love his word. I want to do what he wants. I want my life and my family's life, our church's life, to exist as God has intended it to exist, in His design. There's no other way to be more fruitful, to be more, be more fulfilled, to be more joyful, joy-filled as well. So as we look at the, being the called out ones, I talked about it too, that the called out ones are called out from something, right? Called out from darkness and into His glorious light, or like the song said, it's day. We're called out of darkness and into light. There's a hope that we have in Christ pulled out of sin and into, into forgiveness, into freedom. And I talked about the idea of being foreigners, that as strangers and exiles, uh, as those who are called out ones, that we are God's people, we are now strangers and exiles in the world, to the world. We, we, we walk about as we don't belong, we don't fit in. This isn't our culture, this isn't our religion. This is what we believe, and that's going to be very different. But the opposite is also true. If we don't belong to Christ, and we belong to the world, then we are foreigners to the kingdom of God. We are strangers and exiles to God's kingdom. And, and friends, that is not a place that we should be. That is not a place that you want to remain. You don't want to be an enemy of God. You want to be a friend of God. You don't want to be a foreigner to God's kingdom. You want to be a citizen and co-heir with all the saints. God's chosen people, called out ones. So today, as we look at the called out, we're being called out. Uh, today's title is, is Having Been Called Out. We, we're trying to look at uh, how that, having been called out now, what our mindset should be in the midst of a godless culture, right? We are all over in this world. The culture is crazy, whether it's in our community or not, in this, in this nation or in this world. We are living in a time where the church is, is absolutely in stark contrast to the world around us. And we're trying to answer that question, how do we live in a world that's not our home? Well, the first thing is we set it up. Next week, we're gonna really dive into 1 Peter and start going through that book. But today, I'm gonna to take a little hiatus, hiatus away and look at some, some examples of the exiles and remnants in Scripture 
and the mindset they had to have in the midst of a world, living in the midst of a world that wasn't their home. H- how do I prepare my heart? How do I get ready? How do I approach my work? How do I approach uh, school? How do I approach friendships and family? What do I take with me? What do I not? So that is today what we're going to look at, okay? Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into our word. God, thank you so much for this great day to come together to worship you. And God, we are thankful for your mercy and your grace. We're thankful that you've given us Jesus Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that all who believe in him would have life. We'd move from darkness and into light. We'd be citizens with all of the believers of God's kingdom. We thank you that you've given us that that way. And God, today as we look at the word, I, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to be receptive. That God, we would, as we look at the word, we would see what it is to have a mindset of being the called out ones. What it is to, to prepare our heart and our mind to live in the midst of a society and a culture that is absolutely godless. God, we pray you give us the strength to do that as well. But God, that, our, that the will that we have within us would be from you. The strength would be from you. The courage would be from you. But God, it'd be with our eyes and our minds and our hearts focused on the hope, the only hope, the secure hope that is through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you today in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll jump down to chapter 2 and read verses 9 through 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the chosen, living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now jumping down to verse 9 of chapter 2. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and they will glorify God on the day that he visits. All right, so today, again, we're looking at the mindset we will have as the called out ones. So having been called out, what is the mindset we're to have? Number one is this. Have been called out, remember that the Lord is your sanctuary. Remember the Lord is your sanctuary. I'm going to be looking at Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 through 21. The word of the Lord came to me again. Son of man, uh, your own relatives, those who have, uh, have the right to redeem your property, along with the entire household of Israel, all of them are those to whom the residents of Jerusalem have said, you are far from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. So there's a, there's a possession taking place. There's a, 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 an exile happening here. He says, therefore say, this is what the Lord God says. Though I sent them far away uh, among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore, Say, this is what the Lord God says, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. When, when they arrive there, they will remove all its abhorrent acts and detestable practices from it, and I will give them integrity of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their bodies, and I'll give them a heart of flesh so that they will follow my statutes, keep my ordinances, and practice them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts uh, pursue other desires for abhorrent acts and detestable practices, I will bring their conduct down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord. Interesting, as we look at this this passage of Scripture, I know it's it's one of those like, Brandon, that's a tongue twister. I don't have a clue what you just read. Let me just sum it up for you. God's people are in exile. And when God's people were in exile, they were usually in exile because of discipline. They were, their hearts were already hardened and far from God. So they went and were dispersed amongst the the culture. God's like, if you want the culture... I'll give it to you. Here it comes. And he did. And they were living amongst the culture that was absolutely godless and without hope. And they, they started to realize, wait a minute, wait, this maybe isn't what we wanted. 
So God said, well, I'm still here. I'm still your God. I still am in covenant love and pursuing you in covenant love. So he, he tells Ezekiel to prophesy to them. And he says, while you're away, he says, while you're away, though I sent you away among the nations, even for a little while, I have been your sanctuary. I will be your sanctuary. I'll be your safe place. I'll be your rescue. In the middle of wherever you are, it's so important for you and I to understand that, that you and I are in the middle of a godless culture. We are strangers and exiles. We are the minority. We are people who do not fit in where we are. What hope is there for us? That God is our sanctuary. That God is our refuge. That God is our safe place. That's what he is. So what does he say? God says, well, listen, if you want, to be, want me to be sanctuary, here's what has to happen. Remember, you, you were in Israel and you were my people, but you decided to go to the culture and do whatever you wanted. So I let you have the culture. So he says, if you want me to be sanctuary, those things, those little gods, those idols, those practices that you have been practicing for however long, those can no longer be your sanctuary. He says, when, I, when they arrive there, they will remove all its abhorrent acts, right? Those can't be the sanctuary and detestable practices from it. I'll give them integrity of heart. So God says, I'm going to promise. I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to, I want your heart to, to beat for me. I want you to find safety and sa- sanctuary in me. I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh so you'll follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and practice them. They will be my people and I will be their God. See, for God to be our sanctuary, he has to be our God. Something else cannot. So listen, I know it's, it's tough. In the middle of a society and culture that does not have anything to do and doesn't want anything to do with Jesus, doesn't want anything to do with repentance, doesn't want anything to do with humility or morality, we cannot go there. God is calling us out. He's calling us to be His people. He's calling us to, to call on Him as our God. And for Him, He has promised to be our sanctuary. So either the Lord or the sinful desires and God, this culture, will be our sanctuary. You don't have to ask the question, what is it? Which one is it for us? Is this sinful culture, godless culture, the sinful desires of my heart, is that my sanctuary? Is that where I find pleasure and uh, fulfillment? Or do I find fulfillment in the hope of Jesus Christ? And have I made him Lord? Is he my sanctuary? So having been called out, we, we fear and we trust that God, not others, are our, people, our place of safety. It's not others, right? Not, not only just sinful desires, but we don't put our hope in people. We don't put our hope in, in government. We don't put our hope in the news, right? We talked about that a lot. We don't put our hope in other nations, and we don't fear other nations. We fear the Lord. Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. We're going to read that this week as we read through the Bible reading plan. Uh, Isaiah chapter 8, just right before chapter 9. Uh, interestingly enough, that it's, it's talking about the, uh, the, the coming of the Messiah, that the Messiah is the real hope for, for people. And we're going to see that more in depth. So chapter 8 of Isaiah, if you turn there, and we're looking at verses 11 through 15. Isaiah uh, is here, he's giving people a little bit of a pep talk. He's wanting them to know because there's two, there's divided kingdom. There's Israel and there's Judah now. And Israel's about to get totally punished and wiped out by the Assyrians, right? And, they, and they're, they're coming for them. And, and it's, a, it's a really bad thing. And Judah's going to suffer as well. But, but Isaiah gives this pep talk to Judah saying, listen, you're going to suffer, but it, you're not going to be destroyed. And in the middle of this suffering, in the middle of this persecution, in the middle of this God, this culture that you're going to see all around you, in the middle of loss, here is the pep talk. He's essentially saying, don't let your mind and your heart wander from the Lord. So Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. This is what the Lord said to me with great power to keep me from going the way of his people. Interesting right there, right? That that should be a hook right there. How do I not go the way of of these people? Here's the pep talk. Ready? Don't call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You would regard only the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. He will be a sanctuary. But for the two houses of Israel, he will be a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over these and they will fall and be broken. They will be snared and be captured. 
What a pep talk. I mean, I, I, as I read that, I'm like, that's today. That's right now. Let me, do not call everything a conspiracy. If you want to trust in God, if you want to keep from going the way of the world, do not call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You to regard only the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. Listen, you and I should worry about our place with the Lord and not our place with our enemies. We get consumed, and Judah was too. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. They're coming for us. We're going to be wiped out. I'm so scared. I can't believe this. They said they had this many people. No, they said they had this many horses. They're, and all oh, the people are from within us are going to attack us. All these conspiracies. Well, Isaiah prophesies what the Lord says. Quit believing that. I'm the Lord. I'm your sanctuary. Trust in me. Don't fear the enemies of God. Fear God. Fear being an enemy of God. He will be a sanctuary. A sacred place, a place of protection, and he will be a stone to stumble over. I love this. This is amazing. As it goes on down the list here, he talks about Emmanuel, God with us. And then in chapter 9, it's prophesying unto us a child is born, a son is given, right? We're talking about Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And what's neat about this too is, is, is he's talking about the Lord being a sanctuary. Then he says this. He says, for the two houses of Israel, he, the Lord, right? God, the Lord, God of armies, he will be a stone to stumble over, a rock to trip over. You ever hear that before? We hear that in the New Testament quite a bit, don't we? Who's that talking about in the, New, in the New Testament? Jesus. He is the stone the builders rejected. He's the, the cornerstone. He's the one that they trip and stumble over. And, and people say, well, Jesus, he's not God. Well, it says in Isaiah that people will fall over the stone who is the Lord of armies, God. And then he says later on that Jesus is the same stone. Jesus is God. People will trip over him and fall over him. They, they just will. But you and I, who have expressed faith in Christ, we have him as our cornerstone, as our firm foundation. He is our sanctuary. There's nowhere else to turn. So we will not fear what is around us. We will not buy into all the conspiracies around us. We will trust the Lord. We will trust the Lord. Don't stumble and let your heart and your mind wander away from the Lord as your sanctuary. He is our sanctuary. Number two, having been called out, know that God is faithful. Know that God is faithful. For some of us, that's very difficult to do, right? Okay, we've been called out. I, I get that. I'm going to remember he's my sanctuary, he's my safe place. But, but not only that, he is faithful. He's continually faithful. I'm going to read a passage out of Ezekiel 37, uh, 11. Ezekiel, you write writing that down. Ezekiel 37, 11 to 14. He said to me, son of man, the, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Look how they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are cut off. You ever feel that way? Our bones are dried up, our hope has perished, and we're cut off. Listen, when, we, when we're living in a world that's not our home, where we're living amidst a culture that is godless and cares nothing about the things of God, that is exactly how we can feel. We can feel cut off. We can feel like there's no hope. This, this world keeps going downhill and our bones are dried up. So he said, therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says. I am going to, here's what he's going to do. Here's what God is going to do for us as the remnant, as those who feel cut off, who feel dried up, who feel like our hope has perished. I'm going to open your graves and bring uh, you up from them, my people, and lead you into the land of Israel. You will know that I am the Lord, my people, when I open the gra your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. See, God is still calling us out as the people of God. The called out, the chosen people of God, the called out ones, a people for his own possession. He says, then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. He's spoken. It's a promise. He'll do it. He's going to revive us. He's going to renew us. He's going to refresh us. He will be faithful to renew and to restore. He is faithful, and he pursues us with his faithful love. Number three, having been called out, I want you to turn to Jeremiah 29, but having been called out, we pursue the well-being of the community. We're to pursue the well-being of the community that we live in. 
So turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, if you would. Jeremiah chapter 29. And, and I want you to kind of maybe study this a little more on your own later because we, we talk about Jeremiah 29, 11. It's like, oh, for the, no, for the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, right? Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for hope and a future. And we like cling to that verse. This is so great. And, and the essence of that is true, but it comes to, as a letter from Jeremiah written as a prophetic letter to those who are in exile. So it, it, it's relevant for us, but it was spoken in a different context for God's people, for Israel. And, and we can't have a name it, claim it philosophy on that. Like, see, God wants me to prosper and be happy all the time. No, our hope is in him, and we're going to be strangers and exiles wherever we go. What does that mean, though? How, how, what should our heart do? So in, in this chapter 29, we're going to read verse 1 just to set it up and then go down to verse 4. Jeremiah 29. See, sometimes when things get difficult, we just want to, to re- retract into our own shell. and We want to isolate, right? It's like, okay, fine, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I'm, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'll just be my own person. I'll just retract in my own, in my own hobby with my own people, and I won't, I won't just go into the world at all. I'll just remove myself from it. That's not the answer. right? So here's what, here's what Jeremiah prophesies. He tells these people, uh, it says in verse 1, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining exiled elders, the priests, the prophets, and all the people Nebuchadnezzar had de- deported from uh, Jerusalem to Babylon. What he's talking about here is what happens this week in the end of Kings. 2 Kings 25, you're going to see this is what happened. 24, 25, and, and that's what happened. So here's what he, pro- he says. He writes a letter in verse 4. This is the start of it, at least. You can read more of it today on your own. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Good, good to know for us, right? We're strangers and exiles living in a world that's not our home. He says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourself and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they might bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Interesting, right? We'll stop there for a minute. We'll read verse 7 in a moment. But interesting to see that that Jeremiah is saying, listen, you're there. You're probably going to be there for a while. Get used to the situation. But as you're there... Don't, don't decrease. You're still God's people. Wherever you are, don't, he's not saying intermarry. He's not saying intermix. He's not saying take the culture upon yourself. He's already said clearly not to do that. But what he is saying is while you're there, since you're there, still be multiply. I want my people to multiply. I want my people to grow. I want it to be an influence in the culture. So yes, get married, have children, have them get married, and grow and multiply. Be an influence where you are. And then he says in verse 7, pursue the well-being of the city that I've deported you to. Wow. You mean pursue the well-being of the people who hate you? Of the people who are detestable and doing detestable things? That absolutely have no love for you and no love for God's people? Yeah, that's that's the people. Pursue the well-being of the city I've deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, the city's behalf, the community. For when it thrives, you will thrive. Interesting, huh? We're to be an influence on the community around us in a positive direction toward the Lord. We're not to intermingle into the community and say, let's just do whatever they do, but we're to be a people called out, a people of God's own possession that grow, that kind of resembles the church, right? That grow and then go out into the world that we live in, that we work in, that we go to school in, that we have relationships and family in. And we're to be part of that city, part of that community. That God has a heart for this community. God's love is being poured out on this community. And that God is doing that through us. And that we're to pursue the well-being of the community. Certainly through prayer. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For when it thrives, you will thrive. We see this in the New Testament as well. 2 Timothy, I'll read a verse out of 2 Timothy 2. We'll look at 1 through 4. First of all, then I urge that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Right? The well, seeking the well-being of the city, praying for the city, for kings and all those who are in authority. So that, so that, what are we praying for? So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Not loud and obnoxious. Right? We take a stand when we need to take a stand, but we do it in humility and compassion and grace. We don't, we, we don't, we're not passive and pushovers. But we, we pray, and we pray that for the kings and those authorities, so that we might lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and all dignity. 
This is good and it pleases God our Savior. Who, what, what else is, is he doing? So, so, so we pray that we might have a, a tranquil and quiet life and all godliness and all dig- dignity. It pleases God who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. If that doesn't sound like influence, I don't know what does. That you and I, the humility we show, the reverence we show to God, the love we show to one another, and the concern and care we show to the city is an influence and will produce a fruit. The city might thrive from that. People might come to know Christ through those relationships. 2 Peter chapter 1, 3-8 through eight, it talks about this idea of how, how do we do that? How do we live that way? How do we live godly lives? Well, Peter says this, his divine power, God's divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. There it is right there, life and godliness. Everything required through his power, uh, through the knowledge of him who has, call, who has called us, right there it is, the called out ones, called us by his own glory and goodness. By these, he has given us uh, very great and precious promises, right? So that through them, the promises of God, you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. So there it is. It's saying, I, I want to grow by his divine power in, God, in a life and godliness so that, that through those gifts, through God's power, I might not become of the world. I'll be in the world, but I won't be of the world. For this reason, then, if, I, if that's what it takes to, to be in the world but not be of the world, make every effort to supplement to your faith with, uh, with good, goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and with brotherly affection with love. For if, if you and I, if we possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is here, if you, you might have missed it, we want to grow in those things so that we can be a, a, a people who pursue the well-being of our community, that we can be a people who see a fruit in our lives and a fruit in the community around us, right? It says that if I grow in those things, and that's difficult for us to do, isn't it? We, we tend to take the lazy way out sometimes and just, oh, I'll just go with the flow. No, we need to push against the flow and take a stand and let his divine power give us everything we need for a life in godliness and add to those things, and supplement to those things. And if we possess those things, then we will keep from being useless and unfruitful. So you and I, as the called out ones, in pursuing the well-being of our community, we need to pray. We need to set ourselves apart. We need to pray and say, listen, I, I want to I see the best happen here. I want to take a stand. I want to influence. I want to be in relationships with the leadership or with, with my boss or with my family or with my friends. I want to, in places of school or work, I want to have those relationships for the purposes of seeing the well-being of the community, for purposes of seeing uh, the fruit of my growth in Christ. Draw others to faith in Christ. See, God wants us to be a people that are in the world but not of the world, and he wants our faith and Christian discipline to be useful and fruitful in our relationships in our community. That's what we're to do. That's the mindset we're to have as, as exiles, as strangers and exiles, as having been the called out ones, we pursue the well-being of the community. Number four, having been called out, we remain faithful. Remain faithful. I'm going to read out of Daniel. A lot of you know the story of Daniel, and maybe you don't, but this will be new to you. So we have several different stories of Daniel, right? We have Daniel in the lion's den. We have Daniel, uh, his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right, who, who went into the fiery furnace. You have Daniel who uh, was, uh, understood dreams and, and uh, told, told the king the dreams he was having what, what, and interpreted them for him. We have Daniel who, and his friends who came and said, we don't eat that way, we're not going to eat that stuff, so we're not going to compromise our faith. And we're going to look at that story today just briefly. So you have this, this exile that's happened, and Daniel and his friends have been taken into captivity into Babylon, and then the, the king had ordered, uh, he wanted some young men, capable men, to serve in his kingdom. So Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, they, or before that they were someone else, they came and, and they, were, they were chosen to be part of this. So in verse 5 of Daniel 1, it says, The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he had drank, or that he drank. Uh, they were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to, to, to attend the king. So again, being trained in the in to king's service, they're in exile. They've just been, they've been drafted into, the, into an ungod, ungodly king's service. Among them, from the Judaites, were Daniel, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah. 
the chief eunuch gave them the names. Uh, he, he gave the names. He gave the name Bel- Belteshazzar to, to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Daniel determined. Now, here's the deal. You're living in exile. You're outside of your own culture and world. The norms that you are used to don't fly anymore, and you're being told to do something different. What do we do? Having been called out, we remain faithful to God. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. Now, God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch, yet he still said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has assigned your food and your drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servant for ten, servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. So he makes a deal. He says, I, I, this is what we want to do. Test us. He agreed with them and tested for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men and, that were eating the king's food. What did they do, though? They, they stayed true and faithful to God. Much of Daniel is about that. They would not bow down. They would not stop praying. They would not compromise. You and I need to learn a lesson there, to not compromise. We should not look or behave like the world. And, and I want us to understand something. If you and I are living uh, as exiles and strangers, here, here is the real tough part, this, this faithfulness. Because we know, like, yeah, God, God said this. God promised this, but I live in a world of reality. That's our, that's our excuses. That's our reasoning. Like, I, this is real life right here, and this is just the words on paper. No, this is God's words on paper, and God's words that is going into our heart to be effective, to change us and transform us and to live in a way that he wants us to live. And, and the question we have to answer is, are we going to say God is right, or are we going to say the culture is right? This has never changed. Culture has always changed. And what we have done as strangers and exiles, I'm included in this too. You and I have done this. We have seen society change, probably in a way that God would say, mm, no, that's not the way to do it. And we're like, well, we, let's just, it's okay. It's okay to embrace that. It's okay to be okay with that. And it is in our face today. Like, I, I remember I said that, it was really close a while ago, and then we've done this now, right? It is, there's a stark contrast. And you might be one of those people, and I've been there before, where you're, you're in that place and you're facing that difficult place because you have friends that don't believe certain things about Scripture to be true, and you're like, well, they're, they're, they're good people. They, they go with the flow. They, they give money to charity. They serve. They, they care for people. Why, how can what they're doing be wrong? Or how can I judge them in that way? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to I'm just going to be okay with that. And it's a slippery, slow fade, isn't it? And we find ourselves reasoning out why we don't remain faithful to God. That's at the end of the day what's really happening, isn't it? That we're making excuses for why we're not going to believe or be faithful to God. And it's tough because. We don't have God to answer to right now. We do, but, but not face-to-face, where we have our friends to answer to. We have society to answer to. We have the government to answer to. We have reporters to answer to. We have our family to answer to. Are you going to take a stand and be faithful, or are you going to compromise your faith? This is probably the biggest problem among the church, especially in America today. They don't want to live as strangers and exiles. So they decide we will embrace whatever the world is doing and call it good. Churches are doing this. And I don't even want to call them churches because they aren't faithful, God-centered churches. Uh, We're just going to accept all things, always, whatever comes down the pike. That's that's how we're going to live because we want to be nice to the culture around us. That's not pursuing the best for the culture, the well-being of the culture. That's compromising our faith. That's not being strangers and exiles. That's becoming foreigners of God and friends to the world. 
God says, don't, don't be a friend of the world. Be my friend. I'm the one who died for you. I'm the one who gave you an eternal hope through Christ Jesus. The world didn't do that. Those, those sinful ways of the world will not save you. They will draw you away from Christ. So for you and I, it, it, we, have, we have to. We have to set ourselves apart. We have to take a stand. We have to remain faithful to God, even in the hard times, even if it might cost you your job, even if it might cost you your relationship, even if it might cost you your life. It's happening all over the world. Followers of Christ are losing their lives daily because they have chosen to live as strangers and exiles and to remain faithful to God. Turn with me to the book of Joshua. And in the middle of the Old Testament, before Psalms, Joshua judges before this. Before 1st, 2nd Samuel and Kings. So we're in Joshua, and I want to look at uh, Joshua 24. Because the Israelites have the same problem. Listen, we are not, we are not the first culture, the first uh, a group of God's people who are dealing with this. This has been from the foundation of the world until now. A problem. So we're in Joshua chapter 24. We'll look at verses 14 and 15, and then we'll jump down to 18. You can read the ones in between later on. So Joshua 24, 14 through 15. He says, Fear, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and worship the Lord. So there's this heart pull, the strings like, I don't know if we can remain faithful to that. These people are really nice people, and I'm just going to accept what they believe too. Joshua's calling them out. Fear the Lord. Right, get rid of these gods. He says, but if it doesn't please you, here, this, is, this is the truth to our heart right now. If we are compromising our faith and in, inviting sinful acts as part of the norm in our lives or or accepting it in the, in the norm of society and saying it's okay. This is what it says. If it doesn't, it says it doesn't please us to worship God. It doesn't please us to embrace Him then in His ways. If it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today. Which will you worship? The gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates or the God of the Amorites in the land, uh, land you're now living? What does Joshua say though? Famous verse. As for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. There's a choice for you and I to make every day. As we move forward and as we live as strangers and exiles, we are going to be constantly under the barrage of all these other false gods, these false theories and, and philosophies and ways of living and say, this, accept it, accept it, embrace it. Make it pleasing to you to embrace these things. Joshua's saying, if it's pleasing to you to worship that, then worship that. But that's not worshiping God. Otherwise, worship God. And they responded, and that the response is the next few verses. But verse 18, they says, the, the people responded, The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We, till, we too will worship the Lord because he is our God. We need to be, we're called out as the, as the called out ones. We need to be faithful to God and choose who we will serve. A little story. Uh, yesterday we went to the, the nursery over by uh, Spring Hill. Spring Hill Nursery. There you go. Looking for some, some soil stuff or maybe the day before. And we took our kids with us and we're walking around looking at the plants. And, and, and there's all these little yard statues, yard ornaments, aren't there? And this one little section has like Buddha, 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 naked person, Buddha. I mean, it's like this whole little shrine of little gods, right? And, and my kids are like, this is, this is kind of funny. What, what, what is this? That guy looks strange. Talking about a, a Buddha that looks like this squished, right? And, and I said, you know, I, I, I was like, let's talk. We got to talk about this. I, I'm, I'm the pastor dad. I got to talk about it, right? So I, I'm, I'm like, hey, come here, come here. Listen, that is actually someone's God. They're like, what? No, no. That, that, that's a person that used to live, and they believe they had some good teaching, so they made a figure out of him, and it's their God. That's what they put in their house and around their place to worship and to pray to. Like, I said, so listen, listen, kids, understand that human beings have created with their own hands this rock God. My kids, uh, Bailey's like, <laughs> that's silly. Yeah. What, 
When are, we, when are we worshiping gods that we create with our own hands? When did we exchange the immortal God for gods that are creatures that we created? That's what we're doing. When we're not faithful to God, we're, we're moving towards the gods that we created, the, the pleasures that we desire, and that's what we worship. As strangers and exiles, we must remain faithful. You see, the world has done this great exchange. They've exchanged the truth of God for what? A lie. A lie. And they worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is to be forever praised. Amen. That, that's who we are to worship. That's who the remnants are to worship. That's who the called out ones are to worship. Even when it's tough. Even when your family or friends or the people that you see around you or your political sway or your party says otherwise. We are to worship God and be faithful to him alone. Finally, having been called out, number five, we are to persevere. We're to persevere. I'm going to read a passage out of Haggai, chapter 2. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shetel, governor of Judah, to the high priest Joshua, son of uh, Jehazo, man, speed and confidence here. The, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, there we go, and to the remnant people. So he's saying, speak to my remnant, speak, speak to the strangers in exile, speak, speak to them. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem to you like nothing in comparison? What's he saying? Man, you remember the good old days? You remember when this was different? You remember when society wasn't so crazy? I remember those days. I mean, I have conversations with, with my dad about that. I still remember those days. 30, 40 years ago, it seems like it was just, just yesterday, right? Things weren't as bad as they are now, but they were still bad. And 50 years ago before that, it was, it was even better. They were dealing with it then, too. It's like, remember those times when, when, the, when the, this was right and all things were good? Even so. So what, what does it say? He's saying, I'm telling you the remnant. It, it's not like it used to be. Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. What's it saying? Stand firm, be strong, persevere. This is the Lord's declaration. Work, for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord. Uh, This is a promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. God says, I'm still with you. Take a stand, be strong, don't be afraid. And why? Why? Because God's still doing something. We persevere because we know there's an eternal hope. There's going to be a restoration. There's going to be a redemption that's offered to us. He says, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens of the earth, or and the earth, and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that all the treasures of all the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. The silver and gold belong to me. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first isn't that great? What a wonderful promise. We're like, I, I want the good old days, man. I can't rem- if you could only remember what it was like and how it was then, it was nothing like today. Well, tomorrow, what's coming is, is going to be greater than what we've ever experienced, ever, as the people of God, as the called out ones, God's chosen people, a people for his own possession. He said, I will provide peace in this place. We persevere. He says, persevere because I'm doing something, even Though it's tough, even through tough times, I am doing something. James, turn to the book of James, last one to turn to here. James chapter 1. Right after Hebrews, just before the very end of the, end of the Bible. <clears throat> this is James chapter 1. He's writing this to, to his friends, but he says, James, I'm, I, I'm a servant of God to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. He says, listen, you're remnants. You're, you're all over the place. You're strangers and exiles. I hope you're doing well. Here you go. He says this to them. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you might be mature and complete, lacking Nothing. You know what he's saying? is like hardships are going to come. Trials are going to come. James exhorts us to consider it great joy. 
because that's our opportunity to stand. That's our opportunity to persevere, and that's our opportunity to grow in our faith. Uh, as I taught James, and I, I speak about this verse a lot, uh, trials, struggles, persecutions, what we're experiencing now as a minority, as people who don't fit in to a culture that is godless, it is the gym for our faith. We are to be working out through trials and through, through tribulation, through struggles and persecution. It is how we grow in our faith because it's our, the testing of our faith produces endurance. And let endurance be strong, be vigilant, be courageous, have its full effect so you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Well, how do we, how do we keep that mindset? How do we persevere? Well, it goes back to understanding as we've been called out, having been called out, that God is faithful. God is still faithful through it all. My final verse today is an exhortation out of Lamentations. It says, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. Amen. So listen, we have been called out. And having been called out, we have to have this mindset that we, we are still God's people. We are to remain faithful no matter where we are. And know that as we remain faithful, he is also always faithful. And he will always provide. And there's no one greater to serve. No one, no one else we should worship. No one else we should cling to. So we should stand strong in our faith and be the influence that he wants us to be wherever we are. He is going to be faithful through it. Amen? All right. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. As we look to you, you are our only hope. And we are so glad that you are. Although this world seems like there's some hope in it, it seems like there's, there's things that we should desire that would be more pleasing, but God, ultimately they will fail us and you will not. So help us, God, as, as your remnant, as God's chosen people, the called out ones who are strangers and exiles living in this world, God, help us to persevere. Help us to remain faithful and steadfast in you, knowing that you are faithful to us. God, help us to not compromise our faith, that we would we would look like the people of God. We would stand for what God stands for and, and be the people he's created us to be. That God, we would pursue the well-being of the city. We would influence those around us. God, we desire to see fruit from our faithfulness to you into a world who desperately needs you. God, may our lives shine for the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of God into salvation. May that be what is on our heart and in our mind all the time as we pursue you and be your people, living in a world that is not our home. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.